as the legendary Solo, Morgan Blackhand, prepared to board the hovering AV at the Arasaka rooftops, a hum of death began to ring out. A distinct blend of metallic clunks and hydraulic hisses that formed a symphony of technological precision, each step carrying a full Borg frame boasting the apex of cutting-edge cybernetics. Oh, Morgan. The haunting metallic voice cut through the air. What the? Morgan twisted around and rolled out of the AV's open hatch, clutching a heavy assault rifle in his arms. It was Adam, but what caught Morgan off guard was his armor. One of the massive arms of the power frame Adam is wearing waves a jaunty head low, the biopod clutching it, shaking about like a child's toy. Oh, I'm sorry. You probably don't recognize him from this angle, but this is your friend, Shaitan. Or what's left of him. I'm afraid Silverhand is in even worse shape. At least the Borg's still alive in here. I'd give him another good, uh, 10 minutes before the pod's battery dies. But to get to him, you're going to have to get to me. Morgan turns to the AV and shouts with urgency in his voice. Get the hell out of here, now. Chief, we ain't leaving you here, not like this. You sure as hell are. You have to make sure Spider and me others get out. Now go. I'll be along. In a minute. He was right. The crew on board had too much intelligence and value to risk in a futile confrontation. The crew would just get in his way. He watched the AV lift off, then turns back around. Cocking the rifle, he intones. Alright, Pipsqueak. Time to see if metal really is better than meat. Let's dance. Adam scoffed at such a stupid concept. What possible chance did Black Hand have? Adam wasn't only in a completely different power frame than normal, but there's no chance he could even recognize it. The Dai Oni was the pinnacle of, of K. Arasaka's cyborg program. At a staggering 3.4 meters, the 1.12 ton monsterish power armor was dedicated to relentless destruction. There was no way Adam could lose, right? The two dove in a one-on-one -on -one combat, a running gunfight that saw Smasher's brute force on full display, and Blackhand's agility and precision dancing around his attacks, striking with calculated precision. Despite Smasher reveling in the chaos, Blackhand's heart wasn't entirely in it. He had been dragged into the fight with only one goal in mind, to get Adam to, to drop Shaitan's pod so he can scoop it up and make a break for it. He knew he couldn't afford to waste time. The arbitrary time he had allocated himself was completely shattered in moments. The building had begun to shake underneath the two dueling solos. The nuclear device had activated prematurely. Time was out. The two, from opposite roofs of the tower, launched themselves at each other in a last desperate attempt to kill their nemesis. As the two plummeted into the wreckage below, the outcome of their duel would be left uncertain. So, just who is the towering hunk of chrome known as Adam Smasher, the lapdog of Arasaka Corporation? Well, he is a full Borg solo and rival of Morgan Blackhand, though Blackhand doesn't care much for the imposed rivalry. Smasher has very little humanity left to be seen, not that he had much to begin with. After being reduced to mush by an RPG blast, Arasaka offered him a choice, either pull the plug or become a full body conversion cyborg. With little to no options and a lack of care for his human side, he agreed and became more machine than man. Adam had no empathy for others, including his fellow employees, but Arasaka kept him alive, so he lives to repay their act by killing any enemies of the corporation that they put in front of him. It should come as no surprise that Adam prefers the missions with the highest civilian casualties, often going out of his way to inflict unnecessary amounts of collateral damage. So, what is the story behind the world's most merciless corporate cyborg and Night City legend? Where did he come from, and how did he earn his reputation as the NC Boogeyman? This is the story behind a worthless New York City muck turned cyborg. This is the unraveling of the truth behind Adam Smasher.
But before we continue, I just have a quick word about this channel's partner, G Fuel. Their product line are essentially energy formulas that provide a great drink alternative that has the caffeine, taste, and zero sugar that I usually look for. I'm a huge soda drinker, so to have this alternative is honestly very beneficial to me. They even have a Phantom Liberty collector's box for pre-order right now in official collaboration with CD Projekt Red. You'll get a 40 serving tub and a 24 ounce stainless steel shaker cup, which has some cool Phantom Liberty art on it. You can always order the formula on its own, but I actually really like the design of the shaker. If you're interested in checking out their products, I will have my affiliate link down below. And if you end up wanting to buy some G Fuel or maybe even that collector's edition, and would like to support the channel while doing so, make sure to use code LaidbackGamers for 20% off as well. Alright Chooms, now we can begin. Adam Smasher was born sometime between the years of 1980 and 1993. While his specific age is unknown, his upbringing certainly is not, which is the only reason as to why we can estimate the period in which he was born. His upbringing found him within New York. His mother was Russian while his dad was from the South Bronx. From an early age, he was forced to fight for survival. To be weak was to wither away. This was the consequence of the harsh environment New York City found itself in. In the year of 1993, Colombian drug lords had detonated a nuclear device, destroying the World Trade Center and Rockefeller Center. As a result, the Manhattan borough became akin to a large combat zone. Immediately after the detonation, plans were made to rebuild Manhattan. However, the collapse brought these plans to an end with the eventual fall of the federal government, even resulting in Arasaka being brought in to protect the city from utter destruction. And in the middle of this collapse is where Adam found himself, the leader of a neighborhood combat gang. But what else was there but to kill? There never was much of a choice in Adam's perspective. The struggle turned him into an unempathetic psychopath. Eventually, the army had killed off the last of his members. His reaction was not what you'd expect, at least not from a normal person. He actually found himself jealous of the army's prowess and chose to sign up right away, realizing the far better weaponry the marines had access to, not to mention the warfare he could partake in. But after only six years as a marine, Adam was kicked out for insubordination and returned to New York City, where he would become a contract gun boy. It was a good life for Adam, as his lack of squeamishness and sadistic thoroughness brought in enough jobs to keep him in guns, gear, drugs, and brutal one night stands. Extractions, assassinations, harassment, and demolition jobs came and went, and he made some good Euro doing it. It was an unsuspecting corporate reverse engineering op that would mutilate his life. An unnamed but major corporation had hired Adam and a couple other pros to snatch a prototype gizmo from a competitor. During this mission, he spared no expense in his brutality, firing off even hundreds of 7.62 rounds. But all in quick succession, multiple RPG A warheads tracked on Adam, turning the majority of his body into a lump of meat. His teammates had somehow managed to scoop whatever they could of Adam on the way out of the gig, which was a success. For even cyberpunk standards, what followed is shocking. The dogs had managed to stabilize what was left of him, primarily his brain. After he had flatlined for over 8 minutes, the corp who'd sent Adam on this op in the first place gave him a proposition. They figured he just walked into some bad luck and took interest in his resume, performance record, skill, and everything else he brought to the table. They offered a full body conversion in return for a 15 year employment contract. Seeing as Adam was mush confined to a life support tank and was getting all his senses through an interface, the options were essentially boiled down to this, have the plug pulled, or become a walking arsenal in the line of work he was already in. It was an offer he couldn't refuse, so he went on to become Arasaka Corporation's next big project. Seven years later, 
the new cybernetic Atom Smasher had made quite a name for himself along the eastern seaboard. He hired out for almost any mission presented to him, as long as it wasn't an obvious suicide or double cross. He did have one stipulation, collateral damage and civilian casualties are a must. This was the obvious consequence of hiring a sadistic cyborg, though it wasn't anything a major corporation or even government couldn't just sweep under the rug. During this time, he had developed a quiet rivalry with Morgan Blackhand, seeing the classic solo as a threat to his metal is better than meat philosophy. Adam had repeatedly tried to challenge him to a face-off, but Morgan only ignored him at every possible confrontation. Naturally, this snubbing had simply stoked the cyborg's psychopathic rage higher, and it would require a massive conflict to force the two into a duel. Despite being in contract to his secret benefactors, who we know turned out to be a branch of Arasaka security, he was allowed time for freelancing as well. In 2022, the shadow war between the rival corps, Militech and Arasaka, had turned into the front-facing fourth corporate war. Neither corp could spare any expense, and because of this, Adam Smasher was brought back in as a full-time solo for the Arasaka Corporation. Adam was more than happy to fight for them, as Militech had brought on his rival, Morgan Blackhand, to head their forces. And in turn for his loyalty, Arasaka supplied him with everything he could ever want, including the Dai Oni power armor. This interlocked cyborg body was the pinnacle of K. Arasaka's cyborg program. At a staggering 3.4 meters, the 1.12 ton monsterish power armor was dedicated to relentless destruction. To date, Kay's technicians have only produced a handful of these demons. They're a deep Arasaka secret, and with it, Adam turned into a nearly unstoppable machine. Adam wasn't truly able to put this gear to the test until the peak of the fourth corporate war. On August 23rd, Adam Smasher would find himself present at what would become the Night City Holocaust. Legends such as Blackhand, Silverhand, and Spider Murphy, alongside Militech Spec Ops, Borg units, and teams of edge runners, had infiltrated the Night City Arasaka Towers with the goal of copying or destroying the Arasaka Corporation's Reliquary Database Project and erasing the Soul Killer 3.0 program from their network. In response, Adam Smasher had been sent to intercept Johnny Silverhand's Team Alpha at the Soul Killer Laboratories. It was in the middle of their network infiltration that Smasher and a team of Arasaka troopers ambushed Team Alpha. Adam cut down various spec op troops with his arm cannon, maintaining complete control over the situation and blocking off any possible escape for the team. An unexpected voice rang out in challenge. It was Johnny Silverhand, a rocker boy that didn't have much of a place in a war zone like this. Standing in plain sight, he screamed at Adam, drawing his complete attention. Despite turning, ready to cut him down like any other annoyance, he hesitated. Astonished at the audacity of the rocker boy, challenging him with weapons that wouldn't even increase his armor. So, he raised an arm. The auto shotgun on it opened fired, giving way for the APDS rounds to cut the young rocker in half. Johnny spun and fell to the ground, a surprised look on his face, the Malorian still smoking in his fists. It only takes a second. But a second is all Shaitan needs. The full Borg Black Ops specialist had previously camouflaged at the moment of the ambush, but emerged from the wall behind Adam at this opportune moment. With all his strength, he grappled with Adam, allowing the remaining members of Team Alpha, Rogue, Spider, and a crippled Thompson to make a break for the elevator. Adam lurched around, but Shaitan's grip is that of desperation, with his right arm hanging shattered and limp at his side, blasted by a grenade. It was only a matter of seconds before Adam gets free and takes them all down. His Eclipse Covert conversion was no match for a power struggle against the Dione armor. Finally, Adam managed to get the upper hand against Shaitan, 
hitting him and crushing his conversion. It wasn't enough to just disable or kill Shaitan though. He had an extremely special use for him. So, limb by limb, Smasher tore Shaitan apart until there was nothing left to guard his remaining biopod. The core unit of any full conversion that housed what was left of the individual. With Shaitan's biopod in hand, Smasher pursued Alpha Team to the rooftops. Upon arriving at the rooftops, Adam noticed Morgan Blackhand boarding an AV preparing for extraction. To grab his attention, he shouted his name accompanied with a burst of auto gunfire at the AV's open hatch, getting Blackhand to roll out of it to avoid being hit. He waved Shaitan's biopod, making the proposition clear. In exchange for a chance at saving Shaitan, Adam wanted his long-awaited duel. Blackhand sent the AV on its way and turned toward Adam. He remarked about testing Smasher's philosophy for itself. Their fight would be short-lived and end abruptly when the nuclear bomb in Arasaka Tower prematurely detonated, leaving the outcome of the duel uncertain. After the bomb, Smasher survived and was retrieved by Arasaka, who healed him by replacing what little was left of the man with yet more machinery. Smasher was supposedly tasked by Saburo Arasaka to take care of Silverhand's body and his possessions, being one of the few people who knew where Johnny was buried. Shortly after, Adam disappeared for many years. However, this information is somewhat misleading. While yes, it's possible that Adam was able to dispose of Silverhand's body at some point, it wouldn't have been until at least the year of 2045. The reason this conclusion can be drawn is because of a Black Dog storyline contained in Cyberpunk Red. It details the story of Samantha Stevens, who had retrieved Silverhand's body from Ground Zero of the Arasaka HQ incident and preserved it for decades. It was only in 2045 that the body would be transported from her Night City garage to a friend by the name Angel in New Mexico. This is also when she would give one of the mercenaries, known as Zara, a Malorian that is assumed to have been Silverhands. So, at some point after 2045, Smasher must have found more of Silverhands' possessions in Samantha Stevens' garage and around the country. So it's a possibility that during this time he tracked down his preserved body and possibly the mercenary Zara. Although he had sold much of Silverhands' items, he decided to keep some of them anyway including Silverhand's Porsche and his signature gun, the Malorian Arms 2516. You're likely asking as to why the depiction of Silverhand's death in 2077 is different than the canon events of the tabletops. To cut a long story short, his engram and memory aren't reliable. Not only could his memories have faded over time, but his engram had suffered radiation damage and was even possibly tampered with after the fact. I do have a video covering this subject in full that I will link down below. And yes, Cyberpunk Red and the rest of the tabletops are canon to Cyberpunk 2077. Here's evidence from Mike Pondsmith himself up on screen. During the time of Red, Adam Smasher met Michiko Arasaka, his boss Kei Arasaka's daughter, when she was a sheltered 17 year old girl. The two dated for some time after she had turned 18, something that her bodyguard Kenichi Zaburo disdained, even threatening Smasher to mind his manners around her. Information you'll find extremely amusing when you realize that Morgan Blackhand actually considered Kenichi his Arasaka nemesis, not Smasher. If you're struggling to imagine Smasher being flirtatious in his Dai Oni armor, don't worry, you're not alone. He actually would swap bodies during his time with Michiko, one that actually resembled a young, blonde, a bit overmuscular Elvis Presley. If only we would have seen this in 2077. During the next decades, Smasher would come and go from Night City. He even teamed up with Rogue for a time after she sold out the members of her previous team to Arasaka. And some time after 2050, Adam was finally assigned as Yorinobu Arasaka's bodyguard and was placed in charge of carrying out Arasaka's dirtiest work gaining a reputation for expert management of loose ends. During this time, Adam made the Ebunike docks in Watson his base of operations. Jeremiah Grayson, one of his most loyal men, 
became his right hand, and for a job well done, Smasher gifted him Silverhand's unique pistol. So despite having a reputation for being devoid of empathy for virtually everyone, his gifting of Johnny's Melorian to Grayson indicates that he does appear to have a level of appreciation for reliable subordinates. In 2076, Smasher was brought in by Arasaka counterintelligence agents Kate and Douglas to deal with the rampaging mercenary David Martinez, who was in possession of an experimental Arasaka cyberskeleton. When David arrived at Arasaka Tower, Smasher emerged to save Douglas' life and engage David. The two solos would have a brief exchange of insults before David would get distracted by Faraday, whom he had incapacitated moments ago, being taken away by Trauma Team. Smasher would take this opportunity to shoot David in the gut, resulting in him briefly going Cyber Psycho and activating his Sandivistan. Smasher responded by doing the same and fired a missile that directly hit the back of David's exoskeleton with enough force to eject the latter, Lucy, and Faraday out of Arasaka Tower, the latter of whom fell to his death. David briefly managed to escape with Lucy, only for Smasher to follow, crushing Rebecca to death in the process. Falco attempted to slow Smasher down but was simply swatted away. David, on the verge of total cyberpsychosis, activated his Sandivistan again, but was shocked to see Smasher utilizing one as well, with the latter scoffing that it was a rudimentary implant. You have a Sandivistan? A rudimentary implant. Lucy tried to quick hack Smasher, but this had little effect other than annoying him briefly before her cyberdeck fries. <laughs> You. Smasher became briefly distracted trying to kill an escaping Lucy and Falco, which David used as an opportunity to immobilize the cyborg. None leave the slaughterhouse, not alive. Get distracted, much. A furious Smasher responding by ripping off the anti-grab devices from the exoskeleton, causing it to crumble under its own weight, and proceeded to be a now crippled David. After ripping the exoskeleton apart completely, Smasher stood over a limbless David, commenting that he had some fun after all, and mentions David could have become an interesting construct. As David accepted his fate, Smasher executed him with a shot to the skull at point blank range. By the time 2077 rolled around, Adam was still your Nobu's bodyguard. He usually accompanied him to the Compeki Plaza pet house, even scaring guests, such as Evelyn Parker, who was visiting Yorinobu. A number of weeks after that visit, while the Mercs, V, and Jackie Wells conducted a heist for the relic in the pet house, Smasher accompanied Yorinobu as his father, Saburo, arrived to talk with him. Smasher and Saburo's bodyguard, Oro Takamura, left shortly before Yorinobu snapped and strangled his father. Smasher attempted to stop the witnesses, V and Jackie, but they managed to escape before he could catch them. Upon Saburo's death, Yorinobu became CEO of Arasaka, promoting Smasher to the head of security. During the memorial parade for Saburo, Oda warned Smasher that the parade was to be sabotaged in an effort to harm Yorinobu's sister, Hanako Arasaka. Smasher brushed off these warnings, accusing Oda of disobeying Yorinobu, as Oda persisted in questioning Smasher's actions. Oda was ultimately correct. With V's help, Takamura gained access to Hanako's float in order to kidnap her. Smasher afterwards led an Arasaka strike team, personally rescuing Hanako and ordered for her kidnappers to be killed. Sometime after Smasher had become head of security, he stopped showing up to his Ebunike hideout which was now left in the hands of Grayson. V and Rogue infiltrated the hideout, recovering Silverhand's Melorian and Porsche. Alongside this recovery, several pieces of important information would be uncovered, such as Adam Smasher's involvement with the Kang Tao raid recently reported, and a female body in one of the containers. The woman was strangled, then shot point-blank with hollow point rounds four days previously, as deducted by Rogue. According to Relic Silverhand, this was Adam Smasher's signature style. Afterward, V got access to Smasher's personal armory on the Ebunike, 
While checking the audio recordings on the computer, it is uncovered that Adam Smasher was pulling the strings behind Militech backing out of a deal with Knight Corporation, as he was blackmailing Anthony Gilchrist by taking a woman by the name of Mallory hostage, who earlier in the game had been outed for secretly collaborating with the Maelstrom Gang. During the ending of Cyberpunk 2077, Smasher's fate can go one of two ways, be killed at the hands of V or Silverhand, or be spared and continue to live on. But it is always a possibility that he survives no matter what. After all, Arasaka can use the Soul Killer program to create copies of Smasher's consciousness. Not only that, but his final encounter with David Martinez shows a complete awareness of the use of constructs a program that was top secret at the time. I would also like to use this video to explain a huge misconception that gets tossed around. Many people seem to be under the false belief that Adam Smasher isn't considered a cyber psycho. This is incorrect, and is further explained by cyberpunk creator Mike Pondsmith himself, who states, didn't say he wasn't. There's a concept in psychology called eye functioning. Adam is a high-functioning cyberpsycho who happens to have a job where they want him to kill people." End quote. So there we have it, Chooms. This was the unraveling and truth behind the Night City boogeyman and legend, Adam Smasher. I hope you all enjoyed and learned some new information to further your knowledge of the cyberpunk universe. This video utilized Cyberpunk 2020, Firestorm Stormfront, Red, and Solo of Fortune 2 for sources. If you enjoyed the video and perhaps want to learn more about Silverhand's corrupted memories or Militech's solo, Morgan Blackhand, I will have full length videos linked down below. So make sure to subscribe and check out my other content if you haven't already. As always, a huge thanks to all the channel members up on screen. I appreciate all of your support and the great interactions we all have together. And a shout out to Laser Groove over on Twitter who helped me learn some tools to make the colored Adam Smasher thumbnail for this video. I'm seriously grateful to be a part of the community and a content creator for you all as well. Make sure to have a great week and I will see you later Chooms.